Hello, today we'll look at atrial fibrillation. When we have atrial fibrillation, this is a disease where the electricity of the heart is not working properly. So we are dealing with a fibrillation, so an over-exaggeration of electrical activity in one part of the heart, which is called the atrium. Therefore, we call it atrial fibrillation. And this overreaction is causing that the heart is actually have an, an electricity that is far higher frequency than it should be. We're dealing of more than 100 beats per minute. The, the circuit of the atrium is completely uh, chaotic. And therefore, this can cause that the heart pump function, the pumping of the heart, will not be normal, which, will, which means that the rhythm the rhythm will not be normal and therefore blood in the heart can actually move in a very confusing direction. This is a turbulent flow. And when we, when we have turbulent flow of blood, that can cause a thrombosis. And thrombosis then can travel from the heart into the lungs and then we call it a pulmonary embolism. So it's very important that when we deal with atrial fibrillation, that we understand that, that, that this electrical activity is causing a turbulence of the blood and thereby causing a thrombosis and thereby causing a pulmonary embolism and thereby killing the patient. Because the pulmonary embolism can kill the patient. The same applies not only for pulmon uh, so thrombosis into the lungs, but the same applies when we have a thrombosis that is going into your brain because we know the heart pumps blood not only in the direction of the uh, lungs but it pumps blood to your whole body and when you go from the left ventricle left ventricle that blood will now flow through the aorta and then up to your brain and that can cause a, a, a stroke so the risk of getting a stroke by atrial fibrillation is high and therefore we need to give something called blood uh, blood anticoagulation so we will anticoagulate the blood because then we will make the blood more thinner it will not create a thrombosis so easy so we will not allow the coagulation of the blood okay and therefore it's called anticoagulation and before we start anticoagulation it's very important that we look at some contraindications. Contraindications means that it is contra the indication of giving the anticoagulation. So we are against giving anticoagulation in some cases. And the cases can be, for example, an active bleeding. So if the patient is having an active bleeding at the moment, then you are not allowed to start an anticoagulation. When we deal with bleeding, we're not talking about nosebleed or menstruation. Of course, these two are also bleedings. And of course, these two bleedings can also be uh, increased if we give an anticoagulation. But rather, we are dealing with uh, more severe bleeding. Okay, internal organ bleeding or intracranial bleeding or active bleeding at the moment, uh, for example, from the stomach, from an alcus, alcus or something like that. Another thing that we can see in the laboratory, for example, is when we have a thrombocytopenia. That is when a platelet count is less than 50,000 per microliter. 50,000 per microliter, uh, that is called a severe thrombocytopenia and we are not allowed to start an anticoagulation. Another thing is major trauma. Did the patient in the recent, let's say, one, two, three months ago have a recent major trauma, which means he had a car accident? Did he have any operation, for example? Uh, did, did the patient have any bleeding uh, during this operation? Uh, do, do the patient have many wounds after this trauma or after this operation? Then we can also talk about uh, some history. Did the patient have a history of intracranial bleeding? Because then, please, don't give an anticoagulation to a patient who, who already had an intracranial bleeding, so a bleeding into the brain. 
then you, you, you will certainly risk of killing the patient. And the same goes if we have any tumors, for example, in the spinal cord, or if the patient had any tumor in the brain, please never give anticoagulation to, to these patients. Another interesting thing to look at is uh, blood pressure, for example. So severe uncontrolled blood pressure can also be a contraindication. So we first need to give medications that will stabilize the patient's blood pressure. And if we see that we don't really manage it, so we have been given one medication, then a second medication, then a third medication, then a fourth medication, and we are still having an uncontrolled severe blood pressure, severe high blood pressure, then please don't start anticoagulation. Now, now we have dealt with why we shouldn't start an anticoagulation. We know why we should, because the patient have atrial fibrillation and the patient will get the thrombosis and it will go to the brain and will, and will die. We know why we should start. And now we also know why we should not start it, because we had a contraindication. And let's say that the patient have no contraindications, so we are allowed to start now the anticoagulants. Then what we will do is we will take a blood sample. We will look at the kidney function, the creatinine clearance, kidney function. Then we will also check the regular hematologic lab values like INR, APTT, complete blood count. And here we will look at, as we said in the contraindication part, of thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia will be very, very important to rule out. If we see that the thromb thrombocytes are less than 50,000, as we said, then we have to take another blood sample because we don't believe our first blood sample. We need to take one more. And if we see that the second one is also very, very low, then we need to refer the patient to a hematology department and we need to discuss the anticoagulation. We know that we want to start an anticoagulation, but we also know that the thrombocytes are too... Uh, we have too few of them, so therefore we need to discuss it with uh, an expert in dealing with this balance, because we have a balance here. Should we start? Should we not start? And this decision is usually done in the hematology department, and we will check uh, why the patient or why the patient have thrombocytopenia, because the... The problem here in this patient is not only atrial fibrillation then, it is also another disease, which is thrombocytopenia, which is also in itself a very dangerous disease. Because here we are dealing with a patient that, for example, if it cuts, cut, cut himself, then the blood will not coagulate. So the blood will not stop in bleeding. So the bleeding will continue because the thrombocytes, the platelets, purpose in life is to block bleeding. In this patient, it will not work. So if the patient gets a bleeding, the bleeding will not stop. And here we have a dilemma. On one side, we need to do something for the bleeding to stop. We actually need to make it stop bleeding. But on the other, other side of the coin is that we don't want to make a thrombosis happen because we have an atrial fibrillation. And here it's interesting because this is the opposite thing. Thrombosis is when platelets coagulate and make a thrombosis. And in this patient, we have a very low amount of platelets. This means that we cannot make the blood coagulate less in this patient because it's already few of the platelets activated when bleeding comes. And therefore, as I'm saying, please consult with the hematology department. When we're dealing with another topic, let's say we're dealing with departments here. We said hematology department. There's also cardiologists. Why do we need a cardi cardiologist? We need it in the case where, for example, the patient is already taking clopidogrel or ticagrelor or prasugrel. These three medications are all something called P2Y12 receptor blockers. And these blockers, these are also coagulation blockers, one can say, but in another pathway, they are not acting the same as with these anticoagulations that we are talking about today. They are acting more on the heart. Because if the patient had, for example, a catheter, so a heart coronary heart angiography, 
And we saw that we have a patient who have a very narrowed heart arteries. And actually, it is so narrow that they get blocked and the patient can get a heart, of, heart uh, infarction. So, so in this case, we will now prevent this from happening by giving clopidogrel, for example. And if the patient is now taking clopidogrel and we see this atrial fibrillation and we want, we want to give now a second anticoagulation with, for example, warfarin, warfarin, or we want to give direct oral anticoagulants. We will deal with that soon. Then the question arises, will it not be too much for this patient? Will it not be too much in giving two anticoagulants? Because he has already taken clopidogrel. Do we really want to start with warfarin now in this patient? And that is something that you need to discuss with the cardiologist. So I think it's enough of problems. So now, until now, I've already talked about all the problems that we have. Now let's see what we can do. We have a patient with atrial fibrillation. We will give anticoagulation. And the question is, in which type of patients do we give anticoagulation? For example, we have patients who have mechanical heart valve, mechanical heart valve, and atrial fibrillation. Or we can actually have mechanical heart valve patients without an atrial fibrillation, these patients also need anticoagulation. So mechanical heart valve in itself is enough for giving anticoagulation. Next one, rheumatic mitral stenosis, mitral valve. You can, you can find these between the atrium and the ventricle, and you will find it on the left side of the heart. So between the atrium and the ventricle, on the left side of the heart is mitral valve. And if you see a stenosis here, and it's due to a rheumatic stenosis, a rheumatic, and this is causing now that the area here, the mitral valve area, what you can see on an echocardiography, we'll not deal with that today, but let's bear in mind that we have echocardiography, ult ultrasound that we can check, we can check the mitral valve, and if the area is less than 1.5 square centimeter here, then we call it a severe mitral stenosis and it's due to rheumatic disease here and therefore we need an anticoagulation. This is the second type of patient. The third type of patient is bioprosthetic valves placed around half a year ago. So three months to half, six months ago. Bio, bioprosthetic valves. The, 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 the fourth patient is valve repairs. So we are repairing the, these valves is mitral valve or the tricuspid valves. The fifth type of patient is mitral stenosis due to non-rheumatic causes. Non-rheumatic causes. And when we talk about rheumatic, we are, we're dealing with something about inflammation. Inflammation of joints, inflammation of heart valves in this case. So this is a general inf inflammation of the body and depending on which region we're talking about, then we call it rheumatic mitral valve, for example. Then we're dealing with an inflammation that is referring to the mitral valve in this case. And anticoagulation will then be needed, as we said, in either re rheumatic mitral stenosis, so the inflammation caused a narrowing of the mitral valve that is so severe that we are dealing with a mitral valve area that is less than 1.5 square centimeter. Then we give anticoagulation. But there are also mitral valve stenosis due to other reasons. So it, it doesn't matter what the reason is, one can say, if the mitral valve is so narrowed that it cannot function properly, then we need anticoagulation. The reason why we need to divide the patients into rheumatic and non-rheumatic cases is because we can give different anticoagulations depending on these two situations. If we are looking first at the two patient cases that we mentioned at the beginning, so mechanical heart valve with or without atrial fibrillation and rheumatic mitral stenosis. In these two case cases, we need to start a medication that is called warfarin. And these patients will get anticoagulation regardless of a score that we name CHADVAS score. Chadsvas score. 
the Chad's VAS score should be used when we're dealing with the last three patient cases that were talked about. That is the bioprosthetic valves, valve repairs, and mitral stenosis due to other non-aromatic cases. Then we will do a Chad's VAS score. Let's look at what this Chad's VAS score is all about. This is an acronym. And the acronym is based on C H A D S Chats. Then we have V A S Chats Vas score. Okay? And these letters are just referring to the different things that we try to remember in the score. For example, C stands for congesti congestive heart failure. C as congestive heart failure. H is hypertension. A is age more than 75 years of age. D is diabetes mellitus. S is stroke. And also next to stroke, we can then say transient ischemic attack and so on. Then we have V for vas, that is V, vascular disease. It can also be vascular disease dealing with uh, previous heart, inf heart infarction, so myocardial infarction, or peripheral artery disease or aortic plaques. These are all related to the V, vascular disease. Then we have A, that is age again, but here we are dealing with age that is 64 to 75 years of age. The previous age was more than 75 years. And the second age is 64 to 75 years. And then we have S, standing for sex category. This category is it female or is it male? So once again, when we're dealing with patients that have this, la this last three option patients that I said, bioprosthetic valves, valve repairs, and mitral stenosis due to non-aromatic cases, then we will do a Chad's VAS score. If we are dealing with the first two cases, which, were, with, which was a mechanical heart valve, with or without atrial fibrillation, or the second, rheumatic mitral stenosis that is very severe, that is the mitral valve areas less than 1.5 square centimeter, then we will do anticoagulation regardless of what the score says. We don't need to do a Chatsma score in this case. We will do the Chatsma scores when we have bioprosthetic valves, valve repairs, or mitral stenosis due to non rheumatic cases. And then we will do a score that is the acronym, congestive heart failure, hypertension, age more than 75 years of age, diabetes mellitus, stroke, vascular disease, age more than 64 to 75 years of age, or the sex category, female or male. And we will now give some points. We will give one point for every case here, except the age case. The first one, which is age more than 75 years of age. When we have a patient that is more than 75 years fresh, then he will get two points for that. And the two points will also go to patients with stroke. These are the only two cases where we give two points, otherwise we give one point. So once again, Chad's VAS score is C, C is congestive heart failure, H is hypertension, A is age more than 75 years of age, and therefore we'll, in, in this case we will give two points, then we have diabetes mellitus, D, diabetes mellitus, S, stroke. Here we will also give two points. Then we have V, in vascular disease, A again, but here it is 64 to 75 years of age. We only give one point here, not two points. And then we have six uh, sex category that is male or female. The total point that we can give is nine points. That's the ma maximum score. And as we see here, uh, we need to look at sex category because we we didn't uh, specify this when we have a female only when we have a female we will give one point if we have a male we don't give any point for that because the females have a higher risk of stroke so the higher risk of stroke now will give females one point more because this chad's chad's vas score the only purpose of this score is to estimate the risk of getting stroke. One can say that if the score is, let's say, one, then the risk of getting a stroke within this year is about 0.6%.
within one year. If the score is 9, then the risk will jump up to 12.2%. It's That's a huge, huge difference. So a score from 1 to 9 is a huge increase. If you look at percent-wise, 0.6% and 12.2%, that's a difference about 20. So it's 20 times more higher risk of getting a stroke within one year if you have a score that is 9. So if you see that the patient has, for example, hypertension, he has diabetes mellitus, he is uh, above 75 years of age, if you only take this, these three things, plus he's a, uh, this patient is a female, then we have one point for female, one, uh, two points for the age of more than 75 years of age, then we have three points, then we have hypertension is then four points, and diabetes mellitus then five points. Totally we have five points, and I would say these diseases are very common. I mean, it's very common that we have a 75 years of age patient with hypertension, with diabetes mellitus, and it's a female. Just, just these type of patients will have five points, and we said, the risk of getting a stroke within one year is 12.2% if we have nine points. So in this case, it will not be 12 points, but it will be less. I don't know exactly how much. There's a table. One can check that out. The, 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 the thing I want to point out and highlight is that five points will easily be reached. And what do we do now? We said that in the patient group, the first two patient group, we will give anticoagulation regardless of this CHATS score. In the second group of patients, we said bioprostatic valves, valve repairs, and mitral stenosis due to non neurotic causes. We will make this CHATS score and then we will decide if we want to give anticoagulation or not. And we will give anticoagulation if, for example, the anticoagulation is not one or below. If it's one, then we, one or below, we don't need to give any, any anticoagulation here. For females, for example, we, we always will have one point more here. So let's take a female then. We have a score of five, as we said, with hypertension, diabetes, and so on. These patients will all get anticoagulations because females which have a point more than two will all get anticoagulation. So once you have already hypertension, diabetes, and so on, then you know that this patient will get anticoagulation. The reason why it is so important to make anticoagulation, as we said, is to decrease the risk of stroke. And actually, the risk of stroke, if, you, if we list them now in decreasing order, we have, for example, age between 65 and 74 years. This is actually one of the most and the highest risk of getting a stroke, age between 65 and 74. The next one is heart failure. Third, hypertension, then diabetes, then vascular disease, and then female sex. So the risk of stroke in decreasing order is age between 65 and 74, heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, vascular disease, and female. And then we can also discuss whether the risk of paroxysma atrial fibrillation or persistent atrial fibrillation is the same or not. And actually it is the same. The difference between paroxysmal and persistent is as the name suggests. If it's persistent, then it's persistent. That means the atrial fibrillation is continuously there. If we measure, if we make an ECG, if it's continuously there, then it's persistent. If it's paroxysmal, then it usually is only there for a very short time. Usually we talk about seven days. So if it's paroxysmal, then it comes and then it goes. So maybe it's there for a couple of days and then you will not see it for many, many months. Then we call it paroxysmal. It is just coming randomly. If it's persistent, then we have a chronic type. It is always there. And actually the risk of, throm of embolism, so stroke, is actually interestingly the same for both. Therefore, it's very important that we give anticoagulation to both types. So please don't think that if you only have atrial fibrillation some days in a year, then it's not dangerous. 
no, actually, it is as dangerous as if you have it continuously. So, let's now discuss a little bit about warfarin and direct or anticoagulants. These are the two main options that we can give patients. So, we have decided now with the CHATSMA score, we want to give anticoagulation. And then the question is, should we give warfarin or should we give, give this new type of a direct or anticoagulants? And actually, we prefer warfarin in patients with mechanical heart valves of any type. We, pre we prefer it also in rheumatic mitral stenosis that we said, which is severe. That is a mitral valve area that is less than 1.5 square centimeter. We prefer it also in patients where, for example, uh, the direct oral anticoagulants cannot be used because of some interaction with some other medications that the patient is already receiving. For example, uh, P-glycoprotein drug, efflux pump inducers. Okay, so this is a group of uh, medications that if you give direct oral, uh, direct oral anticoagulants, then it will have a very, very bad drug interaction. And the most important reason to give warfarin, I would say, is if the patient have severe, severe uh, kidney disease, so chronic severe kidney disease. That means the creatinine clearance in the blood, in the la uh, lab that we took, is very, very high, or that the GFR is very low. So we are talking about a GFR of less than 30 milliliter per minute. Then we usually prefer warfarin because it has been shown that this medication does not really depend on depend on this and patients with chronic kidney disease can take warfarin and the direct oral anticoagulants most of them are very very bad when we're dealing with chronic kidney disease so they are not so good and please remember when i'm saying not so good i'm talking about a gfr so a glomerular filtration rate that is less than 30 milliliter per minute usually most patients have a GFR of around 60 and so on. In chronic kidney disease patients usually have around 40, 50, 60. But those who come under 30, then please consider warfarin. I know that there are some direct oral anticoagulants that can be given with a GFR of 15 to 30. But still, I would say, that in most studies and the experience that we have as doctor is that warfarin is much better when we're dealing with a GFR of less than 30. And if we really want to give a direct oral anticoagulant, if, and if you really uh, decide to give one, then please give a liquid. So this is Apixaban. Apixaban is the substance name and the liquid is the trade name. Please give a liquid because this is less dependent on kidney function than the other direct or anticoagulants. And if you're talking about the other end, Dabigatran, so Pradaxa, Dabigatran is a substance name and Pradaxa is the trade name. This Pradaxa is actually, I would say, in my experience and in many settings and many studies, this is the worst. Okay, because more than around more than 80% of Pradaxa is dependent on the kidney function. And therefore, if you really want to give any anticoagulants to a patient with a low GFR, so very bad kidney function, below 30, then consider a liquid if you're talking about direct or anticoagulants. And the most preferred one is please give warfarin. Some advantages of warfarin uh, is also that warfarin can be given once daily should be given once daily. Direct oral anticoagulants, on the other hand, is given usually tw uh, twice daily. One more advantage of warfarin is that we have an antagonist, meaning we can reverse the effect of the anticoagulation. For example, if the patient starts to bleed, he has a big trauma and we need to somehow counteract this anticoagulation, then we can give an antidote, which is actually vitamin K. So we give vitamin K in these cases. Of course, in direct oral anticoagulants, there's also this option for, for example, dabigatran. 
But as we said, uh, if we are dealing with a patient with a bad kidney function, then we usually don't give dabigatran. Okay, we we usually which is Pradaxa. We usually give then Eliquis, which is Apixaban. And Apixaban does not have an antidote. We cannot counteract this anticoagulation. And for dabigatran, we have that. So if we have a patient who is having very good kidney function, then you can give Pradaxa, so dabigatran. And then you have an antidote, and this antidote is called Idaruzizumab. Idaruzizumab, and that is an antidote of Pradaxa. Now, of course, warfarin is not the perfect medication. Uh, we know that it's the cheapest. It's like crazy cheap when we compare, compare it to direct or coagulants. Uh, we're talking about at least, depending on each country, but at least 50 to 100 times cheaper. So not like two times cheaper, 50 to 100 times cheaper, which means that, of course, your insurance company and your, and your doctor and, and not your doctor, but your insurance company and your country at, as a whole would love if, if we can somehow give warfarin instead of direct or anticoagulants. But of course, warfarin is not perfect. These new ones, direct or anticoagulant, anticoagulants, are better. So which are the advantages of these? Let's see them. We don't need to monitor them so much because warfarin needs to be monitored. That means we need to check the INR. INR needs to be checked by a family doctor regularly. In the beginning, very, 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 very uh, um, frequently, for example, we're dealing with uh, every three days and then then it will increase with time. So every three days in the beginning until we give, uh, get to a very nice INR value. And then we can increase it, of course, to one week, to two weeks, to one month, and so on. And when we see that the patient is having a stable level, then we can increase it further and further. The problem is when the patient gets, for example, infected. He gets a pneumonia, so a severe lung infection. Then this whole INR can actually change drastically and the level can be then too high or too low. So this means that when the patient comes to the doctor's office, we will take a blood sample, we will check the INR, and this is not required with direct oral anticoagulants. Therefore, of course, the convenience is much higher with direct oral anticoagulants. So when we're dealing with younger patients who have very low comor comorbidity, so a very low uh, amount of diseases, then of course uh, they, they don't like to go to the doctor's office so often, so they usually get direct oral anticoagulants and, and their kidney function is good. But if the kidney function is bad and we, and we need to monitor these patients anyway, the patient goes to the doctor's office anyway very often, then uh, warfarin is a good option. But as we said, we need to continuously monitor that the dietary level of vitamin k the intake of vitamin k has to be constant relatively constant because this is dependent on vitamin k and drug interactions with warfarin are actually very many so therefore the direct oral anticoagulants are better in this regard also and we can say that fracture risk also fract fracture risk is increased uh, especially in those patients who have already osteoporosis, so uh, bone thinning. So as you see, it's not always so easy to, to decide which one to choose. The straightforward answer was, for example, as we said, mechanical heart valve and rheumatic mitral stenosis that is severe. This, these are obvious. We need, we need to give warfarin. Otherwise, it will depend on the kidney, as we talked about, in severe kidney uh, disease, then please give warfarin. If the kidney function is not so severe, but it is in the in the range of around 30, 40, then please give rather Eliquis. Eliquis, because Eliquis is the best direct or anticoagulants in patients with uh, bad kidney function. And then if we want, if the kidney function is not so bad, then we can give the other direct or anticoagulants, for example, Pradaxa, because the advantage, as we said, was that we have an antidote for that. For warfarin, we always have an antidote. If the price is a thing in your country and the insurance company does not allow direct oral anticoagulants, then you usually need, need to give warfarin 
uh, you have to have some some criterias that the insurance company will accept and then you can get the direct or anticoagulants. But usually every insurance company wants something that is cheaper. And as we said, because it's cheaper does not mean that it's so much worse. Please remember that. So if it's 100 times cheaper, like warfarin is, then it's not 100 times worse. It's not close to 100 times worse. Okay, so warfarin has an antidote and warfarin can be checked with INR in the lab value. And actually, the disadvantage of warfarin is that we have to check the INR so often. But I would say sometimes this disadvantage is actually an advantage because the other medications, the direct or anticoagulants, if you don't check it in the lab, because you do need to, we say, that does not mean that the lab, the, the value in the blood will always be perfect. There can be fluctuations in the value of the direct oral anticoagulated blood. And actually you need to check that also sometimes. And you need to check the kidney function and the liver function in these patients. And actually when, when the disadvantage of warfare is actually sometimes an advantage because these patients are regularly checked. The ones which get direct or, or, or direct oral anticoagulants, they are like forgotten. The doctors say, no, there's no need. Uh, please come back in one year. And maybe during that time, he will have a fluctuation that will make that the blood is not really anticoagulated at the level that we want. And therefore, a thrombosis can happen. So what I'm saying is that sometimes regular checks by the doctor's office is an advantage. It may be inconvenient, but it's advantage. Okay, now let's turn to warfarin and which doses we need to give. So we have decided we will give warfarin. We start five milligram a day, one tablet, five milligram a day, and then we will check it three days after. If we see that the level is good, meaning the INR is between two and three of the three days, then actually after three days, we need to reduce the dose to half a day because the change was very rapid. The, the change should not be so rapid. So uh, the, the target is between two and three. That's good. That's good if the target is two to three, but not after three days. The, the time interval is very short. That means it was a little bit too fast. We want to reach two to three, but not in three days. So if we give for five milligram warfarin daily, and we see that after three days, we already have an INR of two to three, then we need to back up and, and, gi and give half of it. And then we will check it in the next three days. And if we see that the, uh, the INR is not increasing like three, four, five, and it stays around two to three, then we will continue this half, half dose. Okay, so instead of five, we are dealing, uh, dealing with 2.5 milligram instead. Then, or, or if we take another example, if the patient is having an INR of less than 1.5 of the three days with this five milligram, then we can either continue with the 5 milligram or we can maybe consider giving 10 milligram. But I would, I would still give the 5 milligram and then I would check it three days later. And if I see that the level then is not, uh, or no, if I see that the level is less than 1.5 still, then I need to increase the dose to, to 10 milligrams, so the double doses. If I see, which is usually happening, that the INR starts to increase, starts to increase to around 1.5 to 2. Then I continue with this 5 milligram. And then I check it three days later. If I see that the INR jumped up to around 3, um, 2 to 3, then I still, then I still continue and consider maybe in three days to reduce it. So what I'm saying is this is like a titration game. Therefore, it's a little bit, as I said, annoying or not annoying, but it's more time consuming and it's inconvenient for the doctor and inconvenient for the patient. But this inconvenience will make that the blood level, 
anticoagulation is perfect in the patient. So every three days, we check the INR and we titrate it. If we see that it increases too fast, we reduce it to half. Then we check three days later, and then we check it again. If it's perfect, then we keep it at those. Then we check it in three days again, we keep that dose. Until we reach, I would say, if we reach a good target between two and three within about two weeks, when we have that, then we can increase the frequency of the lab test. Then we can say, okay, you know what? You will come now in two weeks time. If we check that again and it's perfect, you know what? You will come in one month time and we will keep this dose. Let's say we started with one tablet, five milligram, and it was perfect. In three days, it went not up to two to three, it went up to around one, 1 1.5 and two. Then it's fine. And we checked it every three days and slowly but slowly we reach the INR level of two, between two and three. Then we keep it that and we prolong the time to two weeks and then one month. And then we can check it every month and then we see, okay, we will now increase the time interval three months to three months. And then we will check this INR level every three months. And that, that is what we call a stable patient. We have reached a very stable level. When it comes to the direct oral anticoagulants, as we said, here is no monitoring required. It's very convenient. You give the tablet and that was it. But as we said, there may be changes in the blood of the patient that we don't even know about. And that's, that's a, a black hole. We don't, we have no idea. There are two values that we can check actually, but that's it. And that's for two medications and dabigatran, which is Pradaxa. Here we can check thrombin time, thrombin time. For apixaban, we can check the antifactor 10. And apixaban was Eliquis. So for Eliquis and for Pradaxa, it's possible to check some lab values. For Pradaxa, the thrombin time and for Eliquis, the antifactor 10 activity. And as you see, and as I want to suggest, is that we have a liquid here, which is very good for kidney insufficiency patients. It is very good that we have uh, a lab value that we can monitor, and that is antifactor 10. So I would prefer a liquid, and especially in chronic kidney disease patients. But otherwise, if we are dealing with antidotes, then dabigatran, so this Pradaxa, is better. We also have for products uh, thrombin time that we could check in lab and so on. So actually, I would say these two are not the best, but they are best in when we're dealing with certain certain criteria like kidney disease or or antidote. And as we said, warfarin has antidote. It has an INR lab value that you can control. And the disadvantage, why well, I will make this point one more clear, the disadvantage is actually advantage. It maybe takes time, but you will have control over the patient. And I know many colleagues and my many colleagues will say, no, why, why do you use this warfarin? It's so old and it's, it's, it's problematic. And uh, I would say that yes, maybe new stuff are good in some regards, but they are bad in other regards. So good is not always better. Remember that. And I will end this presentation with that. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.